Uh, we've been talking about the uh, gospel in Genesis. And one of the things that we have uh, mentioned is how uh, events in Genesis are repeated in the last days, right? And so uh, we see here in uh, Matthew chapter 24, start with verse uh, 37. Jesus here is making a parallel to uh, the last days and a story in Genesis concerning Noah. It says, but as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Now it's interesting here what Jesus is talking about. They're marrying and giving in marriage. Well, what's wrong with that? Jesus attended a wedding feast and blessed it with his first miracle. Right? Uh, marriage is a divine institution. So why, why is Jesus referencing that they're marrying, giving in marriage, celebrating and everything uh, when he blessed all those? He's saying they kept doing it right up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And then the flood came and took them all away. Well, I think what we can see here is that by not that marriage within itself was wrong or getting married, but basically it's talking about how they were just living for the day. And they were all wrapped up in themselves. And nobody was planning for the second coming. Nobody was planning for uh, the coming of the Messiah. Nobody's planning for the second coming here. And so they're wrapped up in their day-to-day -day living, we might say drunk with the cares of this life. And so I, I take that as a warning to me that even the activities that are okay, I don't need to get so wrapped up in my day-to-day -day living that I become drunk with the cares of this life. And I forget about the second coming. As a matter of fact, let's take a look at 2 Peter. Chapter 3, and it expounds on this a little bit more. It says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, on both of which I want to stir up your pure minds by way of a reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Verse 3. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts, and saying, Where is the promise of the second coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Verse 5, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, by which the world that by them existed perished, being flooded with water. Okay, so again it's saying in the last days, people are going to be saying the same thing. They're going to be up, caught up in their day-to-day -day living, forgetting all about the second coming. They'll be scoffing at the second coming. And, and that's something that is very unfortunate, uh, especially we as Adventists. Uh, you know, we were scoffed at in 1844. 
by the great disappointment people made fun of, of the Advent believers at that time. But then I've also seen Seventh-day Adventists back in 2012, nine years ago, making fun of people that thought the earth was going to end because that's as far as the, the Maya calendar went. And of course, we know that the earth was going to go on, and of course the earth did go on. At the same time, we didn't need to be making fun of other people because of their beliefs. Okay, we don't like it when people make fun of us. And we don't need to be making fun of other people. Because in the Bible, the scoffers are always the evil people. Converted people don't scoff and make fun of other people regardless if they're right or wrong. Scoffing at somebody's belief is a sign of your own unconversion. When we're converted, we don't make fun of what other people believe. And, and so it, it's saying that this is happening in the days of, of Noah. Everybody was making fun of Noah. And then... In 1844, people were making fun of William Miller. In 2012, people were making fun of the people who were studying the, the Maya calendar. And there have been other times throughout Earth's history when people thought the world was coming to an end and it wasn't, and they were made fun of. And the fact of the matter is, the world will be coming to an end. Jesus is coming again. And yes, there have been a lot of false alarms. And that's something we need to be careful about is that we're not spreading false alarms. That we're not spreading stories on Facebook or anywhere else that a Sunday law is already coming or about to happen. Uh, because again, this is one of the things that encourages people to make fun. This is one of the things that encourages people to believe that, oh, Jesus is never coming again. They, it's false alarm after false alarm after false alarm. And I know I, uh, I grew up an Adventist, and I remember in the 70s hearing that uh, Jesus was coming soon, and at that time there was going to be an oil shortage, there was an oil crisis, and somehow it was going to bring in a National Sunday Law, and that was going to be the end. And I had pastors in my church and at my church school telling me that the world can't last another five years. Well, five years came and went, and I heard them saying, he's coming in the next five years. Okay, five years came and went. All right. I remember in, in the late 70s, I had season tickets to the Tulsa Roughneck soccer team. They were a, a major league soccer team. And I had season tickets through the 70s. I was in my early teens, and I had some part-time jobs, and I had my own money. And so I was able to buy things like that back then because I didn't have any bills that I had to spend it on. So I bought season tickets. Well, I remember one particular, well, it was 1979. I received a letter in the mail from the Tulsa Roughnecks telling me to renew my season tickets for the 1980 season. And I remember looking at that 1980 in print there in the letter they sent. And I'm sitting there thinking, I never thought I would live to see 1980 in print. I was sure Jesus was going to come before 1980. And I'm sitting there looking at we There can't be a 1980. The world will never last till 1980. Jesus is coming. And it was like, I was like shocked that I actually saw 1980 in print. Because I had been told over and over and over, Jesus is coming. The world's not going to last. And now I'm, there might be a 1980. Well, I don't need to tell you, 1980 came and went a long time ago. 
But one thing I've noticed, and I'm glad, is I don't hear preachers saying anymore that Jesus is coming in the next five years. Sadly, because of that, many of the people who grew up with me in the church and in the school, church school, are no longer believers. Why? Because you keep telling people Jesus is coming in the next five years, and five years comes and goes, another five years, another five years, and Jesus hasn't come. They then decide Jesus isn't coming. And that was Satan's plan the whole time. That was Satan's plan the whole time. To get people to think after false alarm, after false alarm, after false alarm, he's not coming. It lulls us to sleep. And that has always been Satan's plan. Fact of the matter is, Jesus never let us down by not coming in the 1970s. Because guess what? Jesus never promised he was coming in the 1970s. Jesus never promised us he was coming back in the next five years. He says, watch. People who survived the concentration camps during World War II were asked, how did you survive? And they said, well, several people in, in our group, they were so certain that we would be freed by Christmas time. And then Christmas would come and go and they would lose hope. Or they would think, well, he'll come by Easter. Or, or we'll, we'll be saved by Easter. They'll deliver us by Easter. And then Easter would come and go. And they gave up hope. And they finally perished. Those that survived said that they survived because they never put an expected date on their deliverance. They just knew they would be rescued. And they didn't put a time limit on it. When we put a time limit on things, then we get disappointed when God never said he was going to play within our time limits. And we're going to see that here in just a second. So, but the, the fact of the matter is, we do know Jesus is coming. He came the first time. Everybody was asleep when that happened. And we know he will come the second time. All right. So, says here again in verse 5, or, or let's skip down here to uh, verse 7. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years are as one day. And so I, I can attest to that. I, I remember uh, when I was a kid, 10 years old, I would go spend the summer, uh, of course I only had one summer where I was 10 years old. Uh, but when I was a young kid, I would go to my grandmother's house for a week in the summer. And we'd wake up early and we would go work in the garden. Then we would come inside after working in the garden, we would start canning and bagging things. And then about after all that work at about 10.30 in the morning, after all that work, we would sit on the front porch, we would have a lemonade break. Then after our lemonade break, we would go into town, we would run errands. After we're through running errands, we then would have lunch. This, more, this, this week, it seems like I got up in the morning, brushed my teeth, and then it was 12 o'clock. You know, where does the time go? You know, and then it'll be 11 o'clock at night and I'm thinking the day should just be beginning and it's already over. You know, it, it's, it's just crazy uh, how time just escapes us now. 
But that, I believe, is what God was talking about. A day to us flies by like, or a thousand years flies by to God like a day does for us. You know? And, and so, because time is going quickly, we know that Christ is coming. I also know one thing for certain, too. And I believe we're living in the last days, no doubt. But as far as setting a time period for Christ's return, I know this. I'll be turning 56 soon. Okay? And people say, oh, you're still young. You're still young. No, I've done the math. <laughs> I'm not young. Okay? I know I have maybe 20 years left. 24 maybe. Maybe a little bit more. But most of my life is over. I know that. So here's the thing. Regardless as to where we are in Earth's history, I know I am living in my last days. I am living in my last days. So I know that there's only so much longer I have to put up with this earth. Right? So one way or another, I'm living in my last days. And we know that Jesus is returning soon. And we know too, uh, you know, when my mother passed away, it was something I always knew was going to happen. But I still, when it happened, you're like, Whoa, it's already happened. You know? And, uh, but, but it's oftentimes like, you know, we work thinking one day we'll retire or actually back up. We're in school and we're thinking one day we'll graduate and graduation seems like it's a long ways off. But now we look back and it's all just a blur and it's over with, done and over with. We go and we work for several years, and then we retire. And wow, we're retired already. A loved one passes away. Oh, they're gone already. My point is, a lot of times we're looking forward to it while it's off in the distance, and we think during that time that it's a long ways off, but then when it happens, we're like, what? Graduation already? What? Retirement already? What? They passed away already? Friends, no matter how far off the second coming is, one of these days, we're going to look up in the sky, Christ will be coming, and I guarantee you, we're going to think, already? Because while we're waiting, it always seems like forever, whether it's graduation, marriage, retirement, whatever. But then when it happens and you look back, you're like, wow, that was fast. <laughs> and I believe that when the second coming does happen, we're going to say, wow, already. My prayer is that we're all ready. And so here in verse uh, nine, it says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some count slackness. But he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Mm -hmm. Friends, the reason God is waiting is he wants us to be saved. He wants us to be in the kingdom with him. And salvation is not hard. When we look back to the story of Noah, there were animals getting on the ark. If dumb animals could get on the ark, how hard is it to be saved? All you have to do is follow the Holy Spirit leading you. That's all the animals were doing. They were led on the ark. They followed. By the way, I've heard people use the this illustration showing that our pets will be in heaven with us. 
Does God save the animals? He's going to save our pets. I had somebody ask me a long time ago, will dogs be in heaven? And I said, well, if dogs don't make it to heaven, who will? <laughs> you know, now I'm not really saying that there's biblical evidence either way, but we do know that God loves animals just as much as we do, right? But what I want us to see here is that God led those animals on the ark. All they had to do was follow. The reason so many people were lost isn't because they weren't led. It wasn't because they couldn't follow. It's because they refused to get on the ark. That's why they were lost. They refused to be saved. Friends, God is patient with us. Not wanting that any of us should perish but that we all would be saved. I want us to uh, close here with uh, John chapter 12. And in verse 32... Jesus says, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Friends, the only way we can be lost is to resist his love drawing us. The only reason the people weren't on the ark to be saved is because they resisted God's love drawing them. There were animals on the ark because the animals didn't resist. It wasn't because it was hard. It wasn't because it was impossible. Jesus says, when I am lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The only ones who are lost are those who resist. I pray that we do not resist this amazing grace that is drawing us. But we'll be at least as smart as those animals that got on the ark. Right? So that we all can be saved. That is what God wants. That's what he's waiting for. He's not wanting anyone to perish. He's wanting all of us to be saved. Amen. If you feel his Holy Spirit drawing you, don't refuse. Follow. Do we have any thoughts on our study today? Any questions? No? All right. Our closing hymn is hymn number 109.